You're listening to the free, ad-sponsored re-release of American Elections Wicked Game, a weekly march through every presidential election from 1789 to 2024. To listen to all episodes right now, ad-free, go to IntoHistory.com. Subscribers there enjoy ad-free listening, early access, bonus content, and more from a growing collection of great history podcasts. Start your free trial today at IntoHistory.com. It's spring of 1998 in Paris, France. A married American couple walks the streets, taking in Paris at night. At first glance, they look like any other couple enjoying a getaway in the City of Lights. But they're not average tourists. The woman is an actress who has been named one of TV's sexiest women. She has become an obsession of science fiction fans all over the world. The husband is an investment banker believed to be worth between $35 and $95 million. The husband takes his wife by the arm and leads her down a dark side street. Where are we going, Jack? That's a surprise. As he leads her further away from the main thoroughfare, the city lights of Paris begin to fade. Are you sure you know where you're going? Yeah, we'll be there soon. They arrive at the entrance of an avant-garde nightclub. Nothing outside hints at what lies on the other side of the door. But as the couple steps inside, the woman's eyes flash red. She's angry, but not surprised. You promised me this was out of your system, Jack. Oh, come on. It's not being at a club that bothers her. It's the scores of people having sex inside. And this isn't the first time her husband has brought her to one of these places. It's happened twice before, earlier in the spring in New Orleans and New York. She can still see the image of the soiled mattresses on the floor. This place is no better. She feels disgusted. But as she starts for the door, her husband stops her. Ah, don't get upset. You promised me in New York you would never do this to me again. The New York club had cages hanging from the ceiling and whips on the wall. That was bad enough, but it was her husband's request that bothered her most. He wanted to sleep with her in front of strangers. When she refused and stormed out, he'd apologized and promised it would never happen again. But it has. Now she feels like she might be sick. She breaks down in tears. You lied to me. Don't cry. It's not a turn-on when you cry. She pushes through the door of the club and back into the Paris night. She tries to catch her breath as he follows her outside. Look, look, I'm sorry. I'm tired of your hollow apologies and empty promises. I'm tired of you telling me what to wear, what to eat, how to sit, how to look, taking me to these places, trying to control everything. Come on, let me fix this. No, Jack, no, it's too late. In November of 1998, Star Trek Voyager actress Jerry Ryan filed for divorce from her investment banker husband, Jack Ryan. In her filing, Jerry Ryan laid out the events that took place in the clubs in New Orleans, New York, and Paris. At the time, she believed the information would never be made public. But in 2004, Jack Ryan would become the Republican nominee for a United States Senate seat in Illinois. Early in the election, the divorce papers would surface. Jack Ryan would deny his ex-wife's claims, but the scandal would overwhelm his campaign. He would be forced to drop out of the race, and his withdrawal would clear the way for his Democratic competitor, Illinois State Senator Barack Obama. From Airship, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Elections Wicked Game. In January of 2000 in Chicago, Barack Obama was fighting for his political life. Obama was running for Congress in Illinois' first district. To win, he needed to beat the incumbent Democratic congressman Bobby Rush. But he was struggling to connect with voters. To many critics, the 38-year-old Illinois state senator and University of Chicago Law School senior lecturer was all brains and no heart. Two of his advisors, Al Kindle and Ron Davis, 
pushed Obama to change the way he communicated with people on Chicago's South Side. His speeches were stilted, clunky, and professorial. He came off as arrogant, they told him. Obama, a native of Hawaii, also struggled to convince people that he was trustworthy. Congressman Bobby Rush and State Senator Donnie Trotter, another candidate in the race, painted Obama as an outsider. Trotter also famously claimed Obama was viewed in part to be a white man in blackface in the community. Advisors Al Kindle and Ron Davis pressed Obama to respond to the attacks truthfully and emotionally, not intellectually like he'd done throughout the campaign. You're not going anywhere, they said. You're not going to get elected dog catcher. You're full of yourself. You have to let the air out. But Obama blew off the advice. On March 21, 2000, Bobby Rush beat Obama in the Democratic primary in Chicago's first congressional district. But Obama didn't give up. And as he served in the Illinois State Senate, he refined his political and oratorical skills. And in 2004, he launched a campaign for the United States Senate. He told his wife, Michelle Obama, that if he lost, he would settle on a new career. And early on in the general election, it looked like settling on a new career might be a real possibility. Obama was running against well-funded Republican businessman Jack Ryan, and most pundits in Illinois believed the contest would be a tight one. But three months into the race, the Republican candidate's wife, actress Jerry Ryan's claims about her ex-husband surfaced, and Jack Ryan withdrew. Republicans ran Alan Keyes in his place, but given the late start, it was clear to most that Keyes had no real chance of winning. This advantage allowed Obama to focus on big-picture issues instead of his new opponent, and it gave him time to further improve his public speaking. And improve he did. In the summer of 2004, at that year's Democratic convention, Obama stole the show. We are one people, all of us pledging allegiance to the Stars and Stripes, all of us defending the United States of America. In the end, that's what this election is about. Do we participate in a politics of cynicism or do we participate in a politics of hope? Barack Obama's speech at the 2004 convention grabbed the national spotlight. Several politicians and pundits in attendance remarked that America had just gotten a look at its first black president. Obama's oratorical skills helped him win the Senate seat in the 2004 election, and in three short years, Obama would go from junior senator to Democratic superstar. In the 2008 presidential election, Obama's newfound gift of gab would help him fight his way through a bitter primary contest, and it would help him face off against a longtime Republican senator and well-loved maverick John McCain. In the midst of stark political divisiveness, Obama would build his campaign on the foundation of a simple but optimistic message that resonated with millions of Americans. This is episode 56, 2008, Obama versus McCain, Hope and Change. It's January 3rd, 2008 at the Hotel Fort Des Moines in Iowa. It's the day of the Iowa caucus, the first vote of the Democratic primary season. Terry McAuliffe, Senator Hillary Clinton's campaign chair, approaches a suite on the 10th floor. Secret Service agents open the door and usher him inside. McAuliffe sees his friend, former President Bill Clinton, reclining on the couch and watching Virginia Tech in Kansas battle it out in the Orange Bowl. Hey, Mac. How you doing? You want a beer? How we doing? Mr. President, have you heard anything? No. We're going to get our ass kicked. We're finishing third, just behind John Edwards. Not even close to Obama. What? Bill Clinton springs off the couch and calls for Hillary Clinton, who emerges from the bedroom. Terry says we're finishing third. Stunned, Senator Clinton calls together her campaign leadership, including a pollster named Mark Penn. Soon, the hotel suite is packed to the brim. The air is oppressive, and the Clintons are angry. Hillary Clinton demands answers. How did this happen, Mark? I thought we were fine. I said we would be fine if caucus turnout was like it had been in the past. But almost twice as many people showed up as in 2004. Close to 239,000 voters came out. Bill Clinton refuses to accept the number. Uh, That's a rigged deal. Obama's people must have bust in supporters from Illinois. This guy's a phony. He has no experience, no record. He's not ready to be commander-in-chief. He's a United States senator, Bill. That's not nothing. Hillary, you know he hasn't even been in the Senate for three years. And he's been running for president the whole time. Hillary Clinton scans the room, quickly losing any sense of calm. I just want to be clear. This campaign poured over $20 million into Iowa to come in third place. So how do we fix this? The question is not meant for Bill Clinton, but he answers it anyway. 
You all kept telling Hillary she couldn't win if she went negative in Iowa, so she didn't. And you let Obama and his people get away without being questioned about anything. I saw it happening, but I stayed out of it. Not anymore. We need to bring this man down. I think I have to call him. The room went silent as Hillary Clinton arranged a call to Barack Obama. The call was meant to be a congratulatory one, but the exchange was short and impersonal. Great victory, Senator. We're three tickets out of Iowa. See you in New Hampshire, was all she said before hanging up. Staffers were left somber and confused, unsure if Clinton would regain control of the race, drop out, or fire everyone on the spot. The Clinton camp had known Iowa would be tough. They'd been late in developing a ground game in the state, and learning how to increase turnout for a caucus hadn't been high on their priority list. Still, the results on January 3, 2008, were shocking. Hillary Clinton had spent the bulk of the past year as the clear favorite to win the Democratic nomination. An ABC News Washington Post national poll released three months before the Iowa caucus had shown Clinton beating Barack Obama by 33 points. In the same poll, she was also beating John Edwards, who had served as John Kerry's running mate in 2004 by 40 points. The term inevitable had been attached to Hillary Clinton's candidacy for as long as anyone could remember. But that all changed in Iowa, and the results in New Hampshire did little to alter the narrative. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote in the Granite State, but by less than 3%, both Clinton and Obama received nine delegates. For Hillary Clinton, this was far from a victory. So she decided to make a change and shake up her staff. Most notably, she removed Patty Solis Doyle as her campaign manager. Solis Doyle had worked for Hillary Clinton since 1992. Her dismissal was a clear statement that the Clinton campaign was in trouble. Ever since the 2004 Democratic National Convention, Obama had continued to hone his oratory skills, and some had started to compare his speeches to those of President John F. Kennedy. But Barack Obama's campaign had also been smart. They knew they couldn't take on the Clinton fundraising juggernaut when it came to high-end Democratic donors, so they had focused on smaller donations from people across the country. Before Iowa, this grassroots approach had created a groundswell for Obama that had gone somewhat unnoticed by the national media. Heading into the third primary in South Carolina, the campaign continued to do similar work on the ground. They also then started to reach out to prominent Democrats for endorsements. The Clinton campaign was also seeking endorsements, and one in particular— they looked to former President Bill Clinton to secure it. Between the Iowa caucus and the South Carolina primary, Bill Clinton served two specific roles in Hillary Clinton's campaign. The first was call out Barack Obama's lack of leadership experience. Publicly, Bill Clinton made it clear that he did not believe Obama was ready to be president. Bill Clinton's second major focus was securing the endorsement of Massachusetts Senator Ted Kennedy. Both Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama believed Ted Kennedy's endorsement would go a long way in rallying Democrats around them. Bill Clinton had called Ted Kennedy the day after Hillary Clinton's loss in Iowa, but Ted had not been ready to make a decision. Then as South Carolina approached, Bill Clinton spoke with Kennedy again. This time, Ted was more straightforward. He called out the Clinton campaign for stirring up racial tensions, and he pointed to several statements that had angered him. The first had been made by a former teacher who introduced Hillary Clinton at a New Hampshire rally. Some people have been comparing one of these candidates to JFK, the speaker said, and JFK was a wonderful leader, but he was assassinated, and Lyndon Baines Johnson actually did all his work and got the Republicans to pass those measures. The second statement Kennedy took umbrage with wasn't one directly related to his family. An unnamed Clinton advisor had been quoted as saying, if you have a social need, you're with Hillary Clinton. If you want Obama to be your imaginary hip black friend, and you're young and you have no social needs, then he's cool. Finally, Kennedy pointed out that Clinton surrogate New York Attorney General Andrew Cuomo had used the phrase shuck and jive when discussing Obama. Though Cuomo denied he was talking about Obama, Kennedy wasn't sold. So both campaigns headed into South Carolina still unsure who Ted Kennedy would endorse. But once on the ground, they had little time to worry about it. On January 21, 2008, Obama and Clinton faced off on stage prior to the January 26th primary. The debate proved to be a tipping point in the race, and it left some to question whether the party would be able to unite regardless of who won. The most heated exchange in the debate stemmed from comments Obama had made earlier in the week about President Ronald Reagan. Hillary Clinton used Obama's statements to suggest he supported Republican economic policies. Obama was quick to respond. What I said was, is that Ronald Reagan 
was a transformative political figure because he was able to get Democrats to vote against their economic interests to form a majority to push through their agenda, an agenda that I objected to because while I was working on those streets, watching those folks see their jobs shipped overseas, you were a corporate lawyer sitting on the board of Walmart. You talked about Ronald Reagan being a transformative political leader. I did not mention his name. Your husband you, did. Well, I'm here. He's okay, not. Okay, well, and I can't tell who I'm running against know, sometimes. Well. On January 24, 2008, Ted Kennedy called Barack Obama and told him he had the Kennedy endorsement. Two days later, Barack Obama won the South Carolina primary by almost 30% of the vote. The inevitability of Hillary Clinton's campaign was a thing of the past. When longtime friend and Clinton supporter Congressman John Lewis called Hillary Clinton to inform her he was switching his endorsement to Barack Obama, it became clear to everyone that Clinton was no longer the frontrunner. While Obama overtook Clinton in the Democratic primary, the Republicans witnessed a shift in their own race. Former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani had been the party favorite coming into the election, but had quickly faded after losing in Iowa to most of the Republican field, including former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee, former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney, actor and lobbyist Fred Thompson, and Arizona Senator John McCain. McCain, a Vietnam War hero, prisoner of war, and outspoken critic of Republican President George W. Bush, had started to rally support from independent voters, which helped him get a win in New Hampshire. His campaign, once deemed a non-starter by the media, was gaining momentum. While Romney and Huckabee had spent time, money, and energy campaigning in Michigan, McCain had gambled and put all of his work into winning South Carolina, a gamble that had paid off. On January 19, 2008, McCain had beaten out Huckabee by less than 4% of the vote, but he had made it clear in his victory speech what his win in South Carolina meant for his campaign. And as we reminded people last night, and we'll probably several times more, that the candidate that for the last 28 years that has won South Carolina has been the nominee of the party. The tradition held, and John McCain went on to win a string of primaries and eventually separated himself from the rest of the Republican field. On June 7, 2008, Hillary Clinton suspended her campaign, bringing an end to one of the closest Democratic primaries ever held. Obama secured 294 and a half more delegates than Clinton, but won the popular vote by only one-tenth of a percent. As the national conventions approached, John McCain would continue to rally independent voters, and Barack Obama would work to heal the divide left by a bitter Democratic primary. And then, before Election Day, the self-proclaimed Mama Grizzly governor from Alaska would take center stage. As summer turned to fall, Governor Sarah Palin would become an overnight sensation and give the Republicans the boost they desperately needed. Icebergs, jagged rocks and rocky straits, mutinies, misfortune, and broadside battles. There are more tales of the sea than survivors to tell them. But the podcast Shipwrecks and Sea Dogs is doing a good job, and you can listen to all episodes of that podcast plus many others, including American Elections Wicked Game, without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com. Shipwrecks and Sea Dogs is one of my favorites from last year, a podcast about the greatest mishaps, misfortune, and misadventures of the sea. You'll hear stories of corruption, greed, bad intentions, and just plain horrible decision-making that resulted in some of the worst maritime disasters from all over the world. And some of these are more recent than you think. All episodes are ad-free, including bonus content and more, at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. Did you know you can skip ads and promos like these and listen to all episodes of American Elections Wicked Game without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com? And not only will you be getting the whole series ad-free and bingeable, but you also get access to over a dozen more incredible history podcasts also ad-free, like Her Half of History. Because even though Hillary Clinton may not have made history when she ran for president in 2016, there have always been women who seized power, spied for their country, created artistic masterpieces, even escaped slavery. Her half of history is perfect for all those who sat in history class and wondered, what were the women doing all this time? Because the answer is a lot. Get Her Half of History, Wicked Game, and many others ad-free at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. During the Democratic primary, rumors had circulated that Barack Obama, whose father was Kenyan, was not born in the United States. 
These rumors had been linked to Hillary Clinton's campaign, but the Clinton camp denied any connection. It did come out that Mark Penn, a Clinton strategist, had written a memo suggesting they could go after the Hawaiian-born Obama for lacking American roots, but Penn had not questioned Obama's citizenship. But regardless of its origin, the birther movement, as it would come to be known, did not disappear when Hillary Clinton suspended her campaign. Eventually, Obama would release his short-form birth certificate that proved he was born in Hawaii, but even that didn't stop the rumors. However, in the general election, John McCain refused to mention the subject or question Obama's background in any way, while popular on some media sites had little effect on early polls. In fact, when the general election heated up in June, some national polls showed Obama leading McCain by as many as nine points. In order to build on their early lead, the Obama team put a plan in place to use the internet and nascent social media tools in a way no presidential candidate had done before. By July of 2008, a number of pundits were already referring to Barack Obama as the first digital candidate. Obama's campaign leaned heavily into digital marketing tools to engage voters and to conduct massive fundraising efforts. Barack Obama's message was simple. He offered hope and change. His digital marketing team made hope and change the Obama brand, and they cultivated that brand across multiple platforms. At the time, this approach seemed entirely new, but the Obama team was drawing on tactics used by successful candidates from the earliest eras of American history. Back in 1791, Thomas Jefferson had played an integral part in the creation of the Philadelphia-based National Gazette, and then promptly weaponized that newspaper against his rival, Alexander Hamilton. Jefferson had used newspapers as a campaign tool to slander his opponent in the election of 1800. Franklin Delano Roosevelt had used the radio in a way no candidate or president had prior to him, and the growing medium of television had helped propel John F. Kennedy to the presidency in 1960. The Obama team built on these lessons and applied them to the latest forms of media in the 2008 election, allowing his campaign to fundraise and reach voters faster for far less money. The use of digital media also enabled them to pursue what Howard Dean had called the 50-state strategy. After losing the 2004 Democratic primary to John Kerry, Howard Dean had taken over the DNC. Dean believed Democrats should compete everywhere in the country, and while many saw Dean's strategy as foolish and untenable, it had proven effective in the 2006 midterms when Democrats picked up seats in Congress that would have seemed out of reach just a few years earlier. The Obama camp believed in the strategy, and their digital campaign made inroads into states Democrats had long since abandoned. A byproduct of Barack Obama's digital presence was that he quickly gained a level of pop culture celebrity candidates don't often enjoy. This was bolstered by speeches many saw as inspiring, his relaxed personality on TV, and the fact that at 47, he was a relatively young candidate. By most estimations, he was too old to be a member of Generation X. But after 16 years of Bill Clinton and George W. Bush, many in the media referred to Barack Obama as the first post-baby boomer candidate. John McCain, on the other hand, was a Vietnam vet, a prisoner of war, and had served as one of Arizona's United States senators for 20 years. He viewed Obama's pop culture stardom as proof the first-term senator from Illinois was not ready to lead. The McCain camp saw an opportunity to use Obama's popularity against him and demonstrate that America needed a president with experience. On July 30, 2008, the McCain campaign aired what would come to be known as the Celebrity Ad. The ad opened on images of Britney Spears and Paris Hilton and then faded into a scene of Barack Obama speaking to supporters at a large rally as they chant his name. He's the biggest celebrity in the world. But is he ready to lead? With gas prices soaring, Barack Obama says no to offshore drilling and says he'll raise taxes on electricity? Higher taxes... More foreign oil. That's the real Obama. Political pundits debated the effectiveness of showing one's opponent speaking to massive crowds in an ad, but the celebrity spot gave the McCain campaign a boost. It also forced Obama to answer more questions about his perceived lack of experience. In early August of 2008, polls started to tighten, and some even swung to McCain. But by mid-August, the dip in the polls wasn't the only problem for the Obama camp. They were informed by the FBI and members of President George W. Bush's security team that their internal campaign communications had been hacked. They initially feared it had been an act of political sabotage by their opponent, but that was put to rest when they were told the McCain team had also been targeted. 
years later, it would be confirmed that China had been behind the cyber attacks on both campaigns. While Obama's staff worked vigorously to enhance cybersecurity and prepare for the upcoming Democratic National Convention, McCain saw his numbers start to slip again. Throughout the summer of 2008, any bounce the McCain camp got seemed to quickly disappear. Obama was all over television, all over the internet, and receiving what some Republicans viewed as endless free press from the media. Once again, McCain's campaign would have to play catch-up, and to make it happen, they knew they would need something far bigger than an attack ad. It's Wednesday night, August 27th, 2008, in Flagstaff, Arizona, just days away from the Republican National Convention. Alaska Governor Sarah Palin is led into the house of a John McCain supporter. Her day has played out like a spy movie. She landed in a Learjet in Flagstaff under the cover of darkness and was immediately rushed to a waiting car. Other than her immediate family and closest staff members, no one knows she's in Flagstaff. Inside the house, two of John McCain's advisors are waiting for her. Governor Palin, I'm Steve Schmidt. This is Mark Salter. Nice to meet you, Steve. Mark, it's been a long day for you. It has. We left Anchorage before 1 a.m. Are you hungry? You want some pizza? No, that's okay. We can get started. Campaign advisor Steve Schmidt believes McCain's vice president needs to be a surprise and a game changer. Obama played it safe by choosing Delaware Senator Joe Biden as his running mate, but playing it safe won't work for McCain. If he wants to catch Obama, he has to be bold. And with time running out, Schmidt hopes the 44-year-old conservative firebrand from Alaska fits the bill. Governor Palin, in Alaska, you're the boss. Here, Senator McCain is in charge. If you're chosen to be the vice president, you're going to have to do what you're asked to do. Are you comfortable with that? Yes, I, I understand completely. Good. Now, Governor, if you are Senator McCain's running mate, you're going to become one of the most famous people on the planet overnight. Your life and your family's lives will never be the same. Knowing that, can you and your family commit 100% to this going forward? Yes, 100%, Steve. That's great. Now, you and Senator McCain differ on some policies, I know. For instance, the senator is pro-life, but he thinks there should be exceptions if the mother's health is at risk, or in the case of rape or incest. You don't believe that. We'll never ask you to go against your beliefs, but we will ask that you support policies and positions Senator McCain takes on these matters. Do you have a problem with that? No, not at all. Okay. Mark, you have anything to add? Well, Governor Palin, I have an additional question I need to ask you. It's direct, and I need you to be direct in your answer. Go ahead, Mark. Governor, do you reject the theory of evolution? No, no, I don't. My father was a science teacher. He showed me fossils. But I don't think evolution excludes a role for God. Is that going to be a problem for you? No, Governor. Not one bit. The next morning, Sarah Palin was taken to Sedona to meet with John McCain. On August 29th, McCain introduced Palin as his running mate. If elected, Palin would be the first woman vice president in the history of the United States. Initially, the selection of Palin did everything the McCain camp had hoped. Her hockey mom persona, her conviction in her conservative beliefs, and her fearlessness in attacking Barack Obama were a hit with Republicans and independents. It wasn't long before Palin mania, as it was called, took the country by storm. Several days later, on September 3rd, 2008, Sarah Palin appeared at the Republican National Convention in St. Paul, Minnesota, and officially accepted the Republican nomination for vice president. I had the privilege of living most of my life in a small town. I was just your average hockey mom and signed up for the PTA. I love those hockey moms. You know, they say the difference between a hockey mom and a pit bull? Lipstick. Following the Republican National Convention in early September, the McCain campaign found new life. With Sarah Palin attracting national attention and potential new voters, it looked like the election was theirs for the taking. But soon, the conversation in the media would turn from pit bulls and lipstick to something far more grave. In the final stretch of the campaign, a looming financial crisis would reach its tipping point and cause the biggest financial downturn in American history since the Great Depression. That crisis would imperil the financial security of millions of Americans. It would dominate the national conversation in the media and it would threaten John McCain's chances for victory on election day.
Tired of ads and promos like these? Want to skip ahead to newer elections? You can listen to all episodes of American Elections Wiki Game without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com. But not only that, you also get access to over a dozen more incredible history podcasts, also all ad-free. That includes the American Revolution podcast, a deep and thorough investigation of the times, people, and politics behind America's fight for independence. Also, the battles, because we can't start a new American nation without guns. And the American Revolution podcast tells the story of the revolution from beginning to end, from its origins in the French and Indian War, through the war itself, and on to the founding of the United States. Get American Elections Wicked Game, the American Revolution's podcast, and many others ad-free with bonus content at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. Did you know you can skip ads and promos like these and listen to all episodes of American Elections Wicked Game without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com? And not only will you be getting the whole series ad-free and bingeable, but you also get access to over a dozen more incredible history podcasts, also all ad-free, like Wild West Extravaganza, a journey back to the fascinating, tumultuous, and often violent world of the American Old West. From famous outlaws like Billy the Kid and Jesse James, to lawmen like Wyatt Earp and Wild Bill Hickok, to trailblazing pioneers and frontiersmen, Wild West Extravaganza tells the true stories of the real-life characters who shaped this iconic era. So saddle up and discover the true history of the American frontier, the good, the bad, and the ugly, ad-free at IntoHistory.com. It's September 5th, 2008 in New York City. Mo Grime, head of emerging markets for Lehman Brothers, enters the company's headquarters. It's not even 7 a.m., but already the building is buzzing. Lehman Brothers, the fourth largest investment bank in the United States, has seen its stock plummet, and now the company sits on the brink of collapse. Grime makes his way to the fourth floor auditorium and joins about 80 other employees in the audience. Tom Humphrey, Lehman's global head of fixed income sales, takes the stage and addresses the crowd. Good morning, everyone. I want to pass on what I know. Grime bristles. He has no problem with Humphrey, but he definitely has a problem with the mucky mucks and higher-ups who run the company from the comfort of their plush offices on the 31st floor. Grime knows that Humphrey's message is coming straight from the people who got them into this mess. So let me tell you about Spinco. Spinco is a new entity that's going to be created, and it could solve a lot of our problems. So we're going to take the commercial real estate holdings that have an unfavorable cash position and move them into Spinco. So those liabilities will no longer be on the Lehman Brothers balance sheet. That should help Lehman stock bounce back. It'll hit $20 in no time. After Humphrey's remarks, the auditorium falls completely silent. Mo Grimay's hands start to shake. He shoots out of his seat and yells at the top of his lungs. That's it? That's fucking it? What have those fucking idiots on 31 been working on the past two months? This? Spinco? You've got to be kidding. If this is all we have, we're done. Mo Grimay's outburst ignites the auditorium into a cacophony of verbal spars and arguments. Tom Humphrey tries to restore order, but it doesn't work. And Mo Grimay is just getting started. All we've done is take a dollar out of our right pocket and put it into our left. We're fucking robbing Peter to pay Paul. How is this helpful, Mo? It's not my fucking job to be helpful. It's my job to look after my team, because they sure as hell aren't doing it up there. We need to hear from other people. <laughs> Spinco! Spinco would take on a massive debt load. It would be insolvent before it even started. How stupid do you think people are? The market's going to see right through this bullshit. Look, Mo, your time's up. Sit back down. But it wasn't Mo's time that was up. By the end of the week, the employees would flood the trading floor of Lehman Brothers to cry, smoke, drink beer, and shoot tequila together as they cleared out their desks and then stumbled out of the building for the last time. On September 15, 2008, Lehman Brothers declared bankruptcy after operating for 158 years. The event shed light on potentially predatory practices regarding subprime mortgages and home loans. It also portended the collapse of the American real estate market, an international banking crisis, and a massive global recession. If nothing was done, it was clear that upwards of 10 million Americans could lose their homes due to the crisis, and the job market could take its worst hit since the end of World War II. The economy was always a major talking point on the 2008 campaign trail, 
but prior to the collapse of Lehman Brothers, it had often taken a back seat to the Iraq War. In 2003, McCain had backed President George W. Bush's decision to invade Iraq with the intention of removing Saddam Hussein from power. Hussein had been captured and killed in 2006, but American troops had remained behind. The war and continuing occupation had become a lightning rod and had eroded George W. Bush's popularity. But by September 24, 2008, the financial crisis had overtaken the war as the primary election issue. The shift in the conversation did John McCain no favors. As Jesse Holcomb, the former associate director of the Pew Research Center, would later write, Our public opinion survey data indicate that what had essentially been a deadlock contest between McCain and Obama before the Lehman meltdown turned into a solid lead for Obama in the weeks that followed. In response to the crisis, John McCain shocked the public and pundits by temporarily suspending his campaign. McCain suggested he would return to Washington to help find a solution to the crisis. He even said he would skip the first debate with Barack Obama on September 27th if a solution hadn't been agreed upon by Democrats and Republicans. Obama said he intended to show up to the debate whether McCain was there or not and stated publicly, it's going to be part of the president's job to deal with more than one thing at once. Behind the scenes, McCain had contacted President Bush and demanded the president meet with him and congressional leadership to address the economic situation. Bush didn't want to hold the meeting. He was already talking with congressional leadership regularly and didn't see what good it would do. Ultimately, he acquiesced, but President Bush didn't want to appear as though he was trying to influence the election, so he invited Barack Obama as well. John McCain's plan was clear. He would return to Washington and put country over personal political gain. He would help broker a deal between Republicans and Democrats. He would be the maverick who could go beyond party politics to help the American people. Many believe McCain's plan was born out of good intentions and not political machinations. Regardless of McCain's reasoning, though, the plan proved to be disastrous. On September 25, 2008, President George W. Bush welcomed Democratic and Republican leadership along with McCain and Obama to the cabinet room in the White House. Bush said he didn't care what a solution looked like as long as the bill was effective. But Obama and McCain weren't the only heavy hitters in the room. There was also Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, the only female speaker in American history. But after taking the floor, Pelosi didn't do the talking. She told Bush Obama would be speaking for the Democrats. Obama carried the meeting for several minutes. He highlighted portions of the bill Democrats and Republicans already agreed on, and he offered ideas on how they could come together where they disagreed. A Republican in the room would later say, if you closed your eyes, you would have thought Barack Obama was already president. John McCain remained silent for most of the meeting. When he finally spoke, he did a little more than offer a recap of what had just taken place. After the group left the cabinet room, President Bush was stunned. McCain had demanded the meeting and then brought nothing to the table. The national press picked up the story, and soon the McCain argument that Obama wasn't ready to lead didn't seem to hold water. While John McCain struggled with a national emergency, his running mate Sarah Palin struggled with national television. She had sat down with Katie Couric for an extended interview that would air on CBS over three nights from September 24th to September 26th. On the second night, just hours after McCain left the meeting at the White House, Palin arguably made her biggest gaffe of the campaign. You've cited Alaska's proximity to Russia mm -hmm. as part of your foreign policy experience. What did you mean by that? That Alaska has a very narrow maritime border between a foreign country, Russia, and on our other side, the land uh, boundary that we have with uh, Canada. It, it's funny that a comment like that was uh, kind of made to, um, care, I don't know, you know, reporters. Mocked. Yeah, mocked, I guess that's the word, yeah. Um, well, explain to me why that enhances your foreign policy credentials. Well, it certainly does because our our next door neighbors are foreign countries. They're in the state that I am the executive of. The interview demonstrated Palin's lack of foreign policy knowledge, and it made many wonder if Palin was actually prepared to be a heartbeat away from the Oval Office. The segment from the night before had shown a similar lack of knowledge of economic policy. For many, after the Couric interviews, Sarah Palin went from being a driving force of the McCain camp to a political liability. Not long after the segments aired, a focus group of undecided voters was held. One of the women in the group spent her time railing against Obama. When she was asked how she was still undecided if she disliked Obama so much, she said, because if McCain dies, Palin would be president. Palin had been willing to attack Obama in ways McCain would not. Standing in front of large crowds, Sarah Palin had proclaimed, 
I am just so fearful that this is not a man who sees America the way you and I see America. Her attacks on Obama had prompted some to respond, treason, and others to call out, kill him. Palin did not seem interested in tempering those types of responses. In early October, Palin herself accused Obama of palling around with terrorists. This was a line of attack John McCain had consistently refused to use. And McCain's restraint was on full display at a town hall meeting in Lakeville, Minnesota on October 10th. First of all, I want to be president of the United States, and obviously I do not want Senator Obama to be. But I have to tell you, I have to tell you, he is a decent person and a person that you do not have to be scared as president of the United States. Now, I, I just, now I just, now, now look, I, I, if I didn't think I wouldn't be one heck of a lot better president, I wouldn't be running, okay? And that's the point. That's, that's the point. Um, I got to ask you a question. I do not uh, believe in, I can't trust Obama. I, I have read about him, and he's not, he's not, he's a, um, he's an Arab. He is not. No? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma he's a, he's a, he's a decent family man, citizen that I just happen to have disagreements with on, on fundamental issues, and that's what this campaign is all about. He's not. Thank you. Later in life, John McCain would refuse to disparage Palin, but he would state clearly that he regretted not choosing Connecticut Senator Joe Lieberman as his running mate. In the end, McCain's missteps in the White House meeting and the questionable choice of Sarah Palin would prove too much for the campaign to overcome. On November 4th, 2008, Barack Obama was elected the 44th president of the United States with 365 electoral college votes, making him the nation's first African-American president. The Obama campaign's digital approach to the 50-state strategy had paid off. Obama won North Carolina, a state last won by a Democratic presidential candidate in 1976, as well as Virginia and Indiana, two states that hadn't gone for a Democrat in a presidential election since 1964. Obama also secured a majority with 52.9% of the popular vote to John McCain's 45.7%. Barack Obama's 69,498,516 votes remain the most received by any candidate in the history of U.S. elections. After the final tally, he had beaten John McCain by over 9.5 million votes. Just after midnight on November 5, 2008, roughly 7,000 people gathered on the lawn near the south entrance of Chicago's Grant Park. Tens of thousands more convened around Jumbotron, spread out through the area to watch Barack Obama take the stage with his wife Michelle Obama and his daughters Malia and Sasha by his side. If there is anyone out there who still doubts that America is a place where all things are possible, who still wonders if the dream of our founders is alive in our time, who still questions the power of our democracy. Tonight is your answer. During President Obama's first term, he arguably delivered on many aspects of his message of hope. He signed legislation on equal pay. He pushed through a financial stimulus bill to lift the U.S. out of recession. He passed sweeping health care reform, informally known as Obamacare, which extended health care to 11 million people. And he reduced the number of U.S. troops in the Middle East. Still, for many, the change Obama brought to Washington was not welcome. And for many others, it was not enough. Ewan McCaskill, the former Washington, D.C. bureau chief for The Guardian, reflected years later, despite his record of promises fulfilled, the list of failures, too, is long. As McCaskill wrote, Guantanamo is still open. His record on education is debatable. Even though he was the first African-American president, race relations are more tense now than when he took office. On foreign policy, he expanded the drone campaign started under Bush. He also underestimated the rise of ISIS. In the aftermath of the 2008 election, partisanship was on the rise on both sides of the aisle. As author and historian Julian Zelizer would later write, America's political ecosystem started to drown in partisan spin and vitriolic slander. Obama attempted to be reasonable, appealing to the evidence-based angels in our electorate, desperately trying to ignore all the noise. But the partisan noise was what our politics was now about. So in order to win re-election in 2012, Obama would have to overcome his detractors in the media, the rise of the Tea Party in Congress, and a reality TV star hell-bent on bringing him down. 
This is episode 56 of American Elections Wicked Game, 2008, Hope and Change. On the next episode, the election of 2012, as Barack Obama fends off attacks on everything from foreign policy to the color of his suits, former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney defends his religion and fights his way through a crowded Republican primary. But in the midst of a divisive campaign, a New York businessman turned reality television star helps reignite an old conspiracy theory in an effort to deprive Obama of a second term. If you are a careful Wicked Game listener, you know in the credits I mentioned my friend Professor Greg Jackson and his podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. It's a great show. But one way it can doesn't suck even more is when you listen to it without ads. You can listen to all episodes of American Elections Wicked Game, all episodes of History That Doesn't Suck, and all episodes of many more great history podcasts without interruption by subscribing at IntoHistory.com. History That Doesn't Suck is a deeply researched chronological survey of American history from a trained academic who also knows how to tell a story. Plus, in addition to ad-free listening to one of the best American history podcasts out there, you get scores of bonus episodes at IntoHistory.com. Subscribe now at IntoHistory.com. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details. And while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Elections Wicked Game is an airship production. Hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Sound design by Derek Behrens. Music by Lindsey Graham. Co-executive produced by Stephen Walters in association with Ritual Productions. Written and researched by Michael Federico. Fact-checking by Greg Jackson and C.L. Salazar from the podcast History That Doesn't Suck. On a quiet June morning, an airliner took off from the Seattle area, headed to Anchorage, Alaska. Just after 10 a.m., one of the Northwest Airlines pilots radioed in, asking for permission to change altitude. Within moments, Northwest Airlines Flight 293, with 101 souls on board, soldiers and airmen, along with wives and children, on their way to Cold War assignments in the land of the midnight sun, was gone. In the skies 14,000 feet above the Gulf of Alaska, something went wrong. They said they've lost radio contact with the plane. What do you mean it's down? Well, they can't find the plane. Whatever was left of Flight 293, including everyone on board, was a mile and a half underwater. Families buried empty caskets and put up backyard memorials as they waited for answers. Answers that never came. What did happen to Flight 293? Was it mechanical failure, human error, or something more sinister? The DC-7 does not fall out of the sky. If you lost all four engines, any pilot will tell you that thing wouldn't just do a nosedive. One of our planes landed with a Sidewinder missile gone. It's conspiracy theory. And why do so many of the victims' loved ones say the U.S. government turned its back on them and tried to forget Flight 293? Everything about this my whole life was hidden. I just think it's travesty. It was a living nightmare. The military was going to have some kind of memorial. We never had a service of any kind. I'm historian and journalist Felix Bunnell. I've been researching and studying Flight 293 for the past several years. I've interviewed experts and spoken with friends and family members of the 101 souls lost that dark day. Ordinary Americans impacted by extraordinary tragedy who've been searching for answers, searching for healing, and searching for closure. Unsolved Histories, Season 1. What Happened to Flight 293? New from the journalists of KSL Podcasts, searching for answers to some of the greatest mysteries of all time. Coming soon.